All of our predecessors have been swallowed up by us and we are now a huge, fast-moving ship that is heading towards the future. It moves faster, farther, and heavier than any other vehicle ever built. Not all of the ship's hazards and hazards can be predicted, but we can read her compass bearing and headway, comprehend the ship's design, track record of safety, and the capabilities of her crew to some extent. Plot a prudent track across the next narrows and bergs, I believe. And, in my opinion, this must be done immediately. Because of the number of shipwrecks that have occurred in the area. Not only is the ship wear on the biggest ever, but it's the only one remaining. Everything we've done since our brains began to develop will be in jeopardy if we don't act wisely in the next years. Humans, like other species, have forged their place in the world by trial and error, unlike any other creature. We can no longer afford the luxury of mistakes since our presence is so massive. The globe has shrunk so much that we can no longer be forgiven for our faults, no matter how enormous. All of our predecessors have been swallowed up by us and we are now a huge, fast-moving ship that is heading towards the future. It moves faster, farther, and heavier than any other vehicle ever built. Not all of the ship's hazards and hazards can be predicted, but we can read her compass bearing and headway, comprehend the ship's design, track record of safety, and the capabilities of her crew to some extent. Plot a prudent track across the next narrows and bergs, I believe. And, in my opinion, this must be done immediately. Because of the number of shipwrecks that have occurred in the area. Not only is the ship wear on the biggest ever, but it's the only one remaining. Everything we've done since our brains began to develop will be in jeopardy if we don't act wisely in the next years. Humans, like other species, have forged their place in the world by trial and error, unlike any other creature. We can no longer afford the luxury of mistakes since our presence is so massive. The globe has shrunk so much that we can no longer be forgiven for our faults, no matter how enormous. Malaria, lymphatic filariasis, African trypanosomiasis, leishmaniosis, onchocerciasis, dengue, and chikungunya are all infectious illnesses that only exist in the tropics and flourish in hot, humid circumstances. These illnesses impact around 1 billion people in tropical and subtropical climates, including developing and least developed nations in Latin America, the Caribbean, Africa, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. Many infectious illnesses have emerged with a vengeance as a result of global warming and rising temperatures, making it difficult for health authorities throughout the world to keep up. In underdeveloped nations, deteriorating health infrastructure has curtailed investment in public health, and a new strain of drug-resistant infectious illness has caused havoc. Malaria, lymphatic filariasis, African trypanosomiasis, leishmaniosis, onchocerciasis, dengue, and chikungunya are all infectious illnesses that only exist in the tropics and flourish in hot, humid circumstances. These illnesses impact around 1 billion people in tropical and subtropical climates, including developing and least developed nations in Latin America, the Caribbean, Africa, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. 
Many infectious illnesses have emerged with a vengeance as a result of global warming and rising temperatures, making it difficult for health authorities throughout the world to keep up. In underdeveloped nations, deteriorating health infrastructure has curtailed investment in public health, and a new strain of drug-resistant infectious illness has caused havoc. We're debating whether or not to apply for a patent on the clicker in question. If I were prepared to go to the patent office and say, OK, I want a patent on a clicker, period, then I would. The patent officer would have a fit of giggles. I believe that the clicker is nothing new. For a long time, presentation clickers have been in use. We'd have a 0% chance of really getting it. If we could persuade the patent office that clicker deserves a patent, we'd get our wish. However, it would be quite beneficial. After this point, every clicker manufactured would be infringing. And if it does, we'll take one or two bucks from each violator. All in all, that's quite a sum of money. Let's take it to the extreme and write a million words. Go to the patent office and request a patent for this precise item. And those million words detail each and every radius, each and every substance, and every aspect of this. The patent officer confirms that they had never seen anything like it. Take it if you want to. Even if you were to obtain that patent, its monetary worth would be negligible. We're debating whether or not to apply for a patent on the clicker in question. If I were prepared to go to the patent office and say, OK, I want a patent on a clicker, period, then I would. The patent officer would have a fit of giggles. I believe that the clicker is nothing new. For a long time, presentation clickers have been in use. We'd have a 0% chance of really getting it. If we could persuade the patent office that clicker deserves a patent, we'd get our wish. However, it would be quite beneficial. After this point, every clicker manufactured would be infringing. And if it does, we'll take one or two bucks from each violator. All in all, that's quite a sum of money. Let's take it to the extreme and write a million words. Go to the patent office and request a patent for this precise item. And those million words detail each and every radius, each and every substance, and every aspect of this. The patent officer confirms that they had never seen anything like it. Take it if you want to. Even if you were to obtain that patent, its monetary worth would be negligible. Another dog's playful snarls are played back as this dog approaches some food. The dog seems intrigued, but the noise does not deter it from grabbing the bone. The growls of a dog being approached by a stranger are heard here, yet this does not discourage the dog from getting the bone. The sound of a dog guarding its meal is played again in another scenario. This time the dog takes a step back. The dogs appear to be able to discern between different sorts of growls based on these tests. Another dog's playful snarls are played back as this dog approaches some food. The dog seems intrigued, but the noise does not deter it from grabbing the bone. 
The growls of a dog being approached by a stranger are heard here, yet this does not discourage the dog from getting the bone. The sound of a dog guarding its meal is played again in another scenario. This time the dog takes a step back. The dogs appear to be able to discern between different sorts of growls based on these tests. If we remain with the sports example, the brand is the talent, and the response is that you can spend $450 million on the stadium. But, if the player quality is poor over a 10-year period, and they lose more games than they win, there will be a lot more vacant seats in their foyers, right? The brand is the talent, regardless of how wonderful the marketing is or how gorgeous the stadium is. Benny's and Biederman team together once more, great groups leaders like talent and know where to discover it. They take pleasure in other people's abilities. We only promote the greatest accountant in the foolish world of business and government. Is there an accounting department there? Do they have a sales section for the greatest salesman? Is there a training department for the top trainer? Isn't it something you do in sports? Most of our professional coaches were second-rate or marginal players who were outstanding scholars of the game and people, in other words, they were good. Isn't that what a good leader does? When I was a youngster, there was a guy who led Yale University to year after year of NCAA swimming titles. And I've never heard of the scene being verified, but that doesn't surprise me in the least. Their coach had a strange quality, he couldn't swim, but he could certainly encourage swimmers. Isn't that exactly the point? It's a thing known as leadership. If we remain with the sports example, the brand is the talent, and the response is that you can spend $450 million on the stadium. But, if the player quality is poor over a 10-year period, and they lose more games than they win, there will be a lot more vacant seats in their foyers, right? The brand is the talent, regardless of how wonderful the marketing is or how gorgeous the stadium is. Benny's and Biederman team together once more, great groups leaders like talent and know where to discover it. They take pleasure in other people's abilities. We only promote the greatest accountant in the foolish world of business and government. Is there an accounting department there? Do they have a sales section for the greatest salesman? Is there a training department for the top trainer? Isn't it something you do in sports? Most of our professional coaches were second-rate or marginal players who were outstanding scholars of the game and people, in other words, they were good. Isn't that what a good leader does? When I was a youngster, there was a guy who led Yale University to year after year of NCAA swimming titles. And I've never heard of the scene being verified, but that doesn't surprise me in the least. Their coach had a strange quality, he couldn't swim, but he could certainly encourage swimmers. Isn't that exactly the point? It's a thing known as leadership. Only one country, tiny little Bhutan, wedged between China and India, has adopted the gross national happiness as the central index of government policy, and actually has a good deal of success in education and in health and in economic growth and in environmental preservation. They have a rather sophisticated way of measuring the effects of different policies on people's happiness. They are the only country to go that far. But you are now beginning to get other countries interested enough to do kind of white paper policy analyses of happiness research what effects would it have if we used it more for public policy? You are beginning to get countries like Australia, France, Great Britain, that are considering publishing regular statistics on happiness. So it is beginning to become a subject of greater interest for policymakers and legislators in different advanced countries.
Only one country, tiny little Bhutan, wedged between China and India, has adopted the gross national happiness as the central index of government policy, and actually has a good deal of success in education and in health and in economic growth and in environmental preservation. They have a rather sophisticated way of measuring the effects of different policies on people's happiness. They are the only country to go that far. But you are now beginning to get other countries interested enough to do kind of white paper policy analyses of happiness research. What effects would it have if we used it more for public policy? You are beginning to get countries like Australia, France, Great Britain, that are considering publishing regular statistics on happiness. So it is beginning to become a subject of greater interest for policymakers and legislators in different advanced countries. It turns out that frogs, as previously noted, are quite diverse, with over 7,000 different species. Many of these frogs are nocturnal, which means that they only come out at night, but some of these nocturnal frogs also have extremely brilliant colors, such as the blue of the poison dart frog. Because of their toxicity, these frogs are called poison dart frogs, and the reason is because the indigenous people of South America used to catch these frogs and roll darts on their skin, and they would use that to shoot monkeys out of the trees. It is because of their toxicity that these frogs are called poison dart frogs. Having neurotoxins on their skin makes it necessary for them to wear armor that covers them from the inside. What makes amphibians unique from other vertebrates is that they have specific glands that create poisons to protect themselves from predators, which causes the muscles of their prey to become paralyzed so they can't bite and stop breathing, making it impossible for them to kill the prey. As it turns out, a few of them are deadly, and they're out in the open at all hours of the day, so they're flaunting their brilliant colors and displaying their poison nests in some way. It turns out that frogs, as previously noted, are quite diverse, with over 7,000 different species. Many of these frogs are nocturnal, which means that they only come out at night, but some of these nocturnal frogs also have extremely brilliant colors, such as the blue of the poison dart frog. Because of their toxicity, these frogs are called poison dart frogs, and the reason is because the indigenous people of South America used to catch these frogs and roll darts on their skin, and they would use that to shoot monkeys out of the trees. It is because of their toxicity that these frogs are called poison dart frogs. Having neurotoxins on their skin makes it necessary for them to wear armor that covers them from the inside. What makes amphibians unique from other vertebrates is that they have specific glands that create poisons to protect themselves from predators, which causes the muscles of their prey to become paralyzed so they can't bite and stop breathing, making it impossible for them to kill the prey. As it turns out, a few of them are deadly, and they're out in the open at all hours of the day, so they're flaunting their brilliant colors and displaying their poison nests in some way. What I'd want to examine today is the extent to which a writer's writing style and output are influenced by the technology he or she uses, if, well, a pen can be considered technology. Personality and educational background can also have an impact on prose style, so I'd like to take those into account as well. Now that the writing instrument used can be measured, it isn't as difficult to determine productivity levels. Refilling and sharpening a quill pen would lead to an unhurried style of writing that relied heavily on concise phrases. Fielding, Smollett, and Richardson, three of the greatest 18th century authors, had a comparatively little output despite the immense length of their works. It wasn't until the mid-19th century that the fountain pen was created. Dickens and Thackeray, for example, did not have to constantly restock their supply, which may explain why they were able to produce such a large volume of work. The typewriter, on the other hand, was designed to expedite the writing process once you mastered it, which made it popular among journalists. A short-winded style of writing, I believe, was born out of this. In the prose form if you choose. According to one author, writing became more conversational and long-winded because of the use of tape recorders or dictating machines. 
it is possible that Henry James dictated some of his later works even though he did not utilize these devices. No word processes, computers or cinematic narrative approaches are going to be discussed today. What I'd want to examine today is the extent to which a writer's writing style and output are influenced by the technology he or she uses, if, well, a pen can be considered technology. Personality and educational background can also have an impact on prose style, so I'd like to take those into account as well. Now that the writing instrument used can be measured, it isn't as difficult to determine productivity levels. Refilling and sharpening a quill pen would lead to an unhurried style of writing that relied heavily on concise phrases. Fielding, Smollett, and Richardson, three of the greatest 18th century authors, had a comparatively little output despite the immense length of their works. It wasn't until the mid-19th century that the fountain pen was created. Dickens and Thackeray, for example, did not have to constantly restock their supply, which may explain why they were able to produce such a large volume of work. The typewriter, on the other hand, was designed to expedite the writing process once you mastered it, which made it popular among journalists. A short-winded style of writing, I believe, was born out of this. In the prose form if you choose. According to one author, writing became more conversational and long-winded because of the use of tape recorders or dictating machines. It is possible that Henry James dictated some of his later works even though he did not utilize these devices. No word processes, computers or cinematic narrative approaches are going to be discussed today. If we remain with the sports example, the brand is the talent, and the response is that you can spend $450 million on the stadium. But, if the player quality is poor over a 10-year period, and they lose more games than they win, there will be a lot more vacant seats in their foyers, right? The brand is the talent, regardless of how wonderful the marketing is or how gorgeous the stadium is. Benny's and Biederman team together once more, great groups leaders like talent and know where to discover it. They take pleasure in other people's abilities. We only promote the greatest accountant in the foolish world of business and government. Is there an accounting department there? Do they have a sales section for the greatest salesman? Is there a training department for the top trainer? Isn't it something you do in sports? Most of our professional coaches were second-rate or marginal players who were outstanding scholars of the game and people, in other words, they were good. Isn't that what a good leader does? When I was a youngster, there was a guy who led Yale University to year after year of NCAA swimming titles. And I've never heard of the scene being verified, but that doesn't surprise me in the least. Their coach had a strange quality, he couldn't swim, but he could certainly encourage swimmers. Isn't that exactly the point? It's a thing known as leadership. If we remain with the sports example, the brand is the talent, and the response is that you can spend $450 million on the stadium. But, if the player quality is poor over a 10-year period, and they lose more games than they win, there will be a lot more vacant seats in their foyers, right? The brand is the talent, regardless of how wonderful the marketing is or how gorgeous the stadium is. 
Benny's and Biederman team together once more, great groups leaders like talent and know where to discover it. They take pleasure in other people's abilities. We only promote the greatest accountant in the foolish world of business and government. Is there an accounting department there? Do they have a sales section for the greatest salesman? Is there a training department for the top trainer? Isn't it something you do in sports? Most of our professional coaches were second rate or marginal players who were outstanding scholars of the game and people, in other words, they were good. Isn't that what a good leader does? When I was a youngster, there was a guy who led Yale University to year after year of NCAA swimming titles. And I've never heard of the scene being verified, but that doesn't surprise me in the least. Their coach had a strange quality, he couldn't swim, but he could certainly encourage swimmers. Isn't that exactly the point? It's a thing known as leadership. Quantum foam is a concept that arises from applying quantum physics to the fabric of space and time. In general activity, Einstein showed us that space and time are not static backdrops. They are part of a cosmic unfolding in which space and time may stretch and curve, resulting in the force of gravity. When you understand that space and time are dynamic, you'll realize that they're not just abstract concepts. They must, after all, be subject to quantum physics principles. The uncertainty principle is a crucial part of quantum physics that is important. When it comes to space and time, it's an unpredictable space and time, which means it may radically change. In some ways, they resemble the fiercely boiling surface of a pot of water. When you look at space, time, and extremely microscopic scales. So the concept is that if you look at space on small and small sizes, not daily scales, but microscopic ones, the uncertainty grows and grows, and space and time become foamy. They appear to be bubbly. They have a phonetic undulating appearance. That's quantum foam at the extremely tiny size, which we've been battling for decades since Einstein's arithmetic doesn't apply down there. We've been trying to reconcile the contradiction between quantum mechanics and math Einstein in order to grasp what's really going on with the quantum foam. Quantum foam is a concept that arises from applying quantum physics to the fabric of space and time. In general activity, Einstein showed us that space and time are not static backdrops. They are part of a cosmic unfolding in which space and time may stretch and curve, resulting in the force of gravity. When you understand that space and time are dynamic, you'll realize that they're not just abstract concepts. They must, after all, be subject to quantum physics principles. The uncertainty principle is a crucial part of quantum physics that is important. When it comes to space and time, it's an unpredictable space and time, which means it may radically change. In some ways, they resemble the fiercely boiling surface of a pot of water. When you look at space, time, and extremely microscopic scales. So the concept is that if you look at space on small and small sizes, not daily scales, but microscopic ones, the uncertainty grows and grows, and space and time become foamy. They appear to be bubbly. They have a phonetic undulating appearance. That's quantum foam at the extremely tiny size, which we've been battling for decades since Einstein's arithmetic doesn't apply down there. We've been trying to reconcile the contradiction between quantum mechanics and math Einstein in order to grasp what's really going on with the quantum foam.